Welcome today. We're at the headquarter of G2 and um, we are in Berlin. So we don't expect that, <laughs> that you have your headquarter here, but let's start. Q and you. Let's talk about esports. Epic future. What's your name and what's your tasks here at G2? Yeah. Welcome, first of all, to Berlin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Danny Engels. I'm officially the head of team operations, which is basically the name for the guy that takes care of all the professional teams and players that we have. So I'm pretty much working hand in hand with the team managers that we have for the respective teams, which ranges from League of Legends through Counter Strike, even up to Sim Racing, yes. Right. Hi, also welcome to Berlin. I hope you like our new office. We I love, love it very much. I love it. <laughs> Um, I'm Sabrina, um, I joined G2 about 15 months ago and I look after business development. Right. Um, and how did you come to eSports personally? Not G2, so personally your relationship sometimes to, to eSports. Well, for me, I had the most horrendous battles with my sister on Mario Kart um, <laughs> so at an early age. And then there was a bit of a break in my personal gaming <laughs> career. <laughs> I started playing um, Lara Croft, like Tomb Raider, and I was so bad that I even had to have this book that gives you tips and tricks. Otherwise, I couldn't finish the game. So that gives you a good indi indication about my talent, which is very limited. <laughs> uh, and that was pretty much the end of my gaming career, unfortunately. But now with G2, um, I, I turn into a little League of Legends fangirl, I must say. So I watch it during the regular split. split. I watch it every Friday, every Saturday, and I'm really into it. Um, despite I'm not watching it, I really enjoy it. Uh, sorry, I'm not playing it. I'm, I really enjoy watching it. And what about you? Yeah, traditional gamer career, I would say. Uh, <laughs> so I've been a nerd myself, uh, also played Mario Kart and these kind of games, but I actually became a professional gamer for SK Gaming back in the day, so I think it was around 2006, 2007. Then have been part of SK Gaming for five years, where I also know Carlos from since he was there at the same time. Um, and then moved on to basically graduate in IT management and kind of found my way back to, to eSports somehow. I've never left really because I've always followed the, the games. I've been a diehard Counter-Strike fan even back in the days. I've uh, seen League of Legends grow as well in the first couple of seasons. I've seen Carlos cry on stage and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, that hurts so much. I see too. Oh. We are making fun of it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've always been around, but then uh, decided to go normal, normal way, IT management, uh, but somehow ended up in G2 Esports again as a team manager for a sim racing team. And ever since then, I think it was roughly two and a half years ago, made my way up to basically leading all the gaming professional teams. And which way do you come professionally before G2? Uh, do you learn something regular or something? I mean, as I said, I just uh, graduated. Did you have a IT. job before? Yeah, I actually had. I actually had, right. I actually had in a public institution in the Handwerkskammer in my, in my old town okay. um, in IT management. Okay. Then, yeah found my way into esports, which is completely different. And what about you? Yeah, I don't really come from esports. Uh, the last seven years I spent at Red Bull, um, was there for quite a long time, um, have an international marketing background. And with Red Bull, I was looking after or managing our global partnerships team. And in that role, we obviously, because at Red Bull, you kind of have this big bunch of flowers of sports and culture and entertainment, right, that you're selling and offering to suitable partners. And in, in that remit, I also looked after esports, but it was obviously from a pure event and editorial content standpoint. And then once I joined G2, I had this massive... Um, massive learning curve and deep dive into the scene. So I actually really understood what eSports is only when I started working for G2. Okay, let's jump ahead. So it's maybe the right point of it. Um, the G2 events and the team here, it's very familiar, so I think. And how is it in it events? You go together there, everyone's watching together. How, how it is? We are always happy if we cross path at the event, right? Yeah, So <laughs> I, I usually focus on staying with the teams because this is where, where I'm basically uh, leading the operations, of course. So I'm super close with all the team managers. And then the players, of course, if they go to tournaments, 
and more often than not they are kind of separated to all the other stuff that we have at the event so they rarely cross part with, uh, path with partnership team for example only if we do some activation together with partners um, their time is just so limited at events as well and they just are more often than not obviously focused on the game that they don't think about anything else so i stick more with the players whereas sabrina pretty much sees a whole different side from events <laughs> as well i guess exactly so yeah as dennis said oftentimes we don't even see each other which is a real oh. shame but um, we usually host clients, I think for us it's the most important for especially non-endemic brands to bring to events because only then you really understand this incredible and magic atmosphere that happens in the arena and the passion points around esports is something you will only understand once you go to a, uh, to a live event, right? And that's why those events are so essential for us. Um, and then obviously we've got people on site that help us with the booth. That's our event team, which Michael is heading, is doing an incredible job in that space. Um, and then oftentimes depending on the tournaments, we have our team here on site doing group team viewings. Um, we've got this big screen in, the, in our office where we then all come together or everyone that is not on site and tries to watch the games together. If there, you have many teams, so there's many people involved in it. Is there something like a Christmas fest? Uh, fest as I don't think is it is Christmas right? party? Pa party, Christmas party, or something Coming like out. this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hope so. Um, come there, every player together, or how is it organized? Wait, that's the reality of esports. We try to get everyone here, of course, because they should all be part of this G two army, G two family. Of course, celebrating Christmas together. Um, plans were different two weeks ago. This is just the nature how esports is. By now, um, we have come to the conclusion, conclusion that, for example, Rainbow Six still has to play a tournament over the Christmas period, so they can unfortunately okay. not join us. Mm. Um, League of Legends rather wants to, to enjoy the off-season because they will also have an early start next year with a lot of partner and content and then into the LEC. So we definitely invited every player that we have just to make them feel part of what we are. Um, some of them will also come here for, for celebrating Christmas, of course, but it just, esports, it never stops, so to say. So business just um, keeps moving also during Christmas period, yeah. Right. Um, and the G2 army, it's so big. <laughs> I don't, um, when I start, yeah, I get to know esports you can't get away without seeing the G2 army. So, um, and the mask on the, on the uh, world ship, it was incredible and looks so nice. So, um, let's go a few years back. Do you, can, can you tell me how this phenomenon begin? It's probably better for me, right? Because yeah. I have been, have been there in the early exactly. days, which it's funny to look back at because in the beginning and you see so many faces that I've met at the beginning, so many big guys that to say now in the esports ecosystem, uh, I knew them from back in the past already, which obviously has my job as well, of course. Um, it just amazes me every single time, not only going to events, but also even entering this office, how passionate this entire world is. Um, and I think this is what has driven the phenomenon to almost the mainstream thing now that back in the days we had so many passionate guys working on this one vision of having competitive computer gaming to be professionalized in a way that we are now uh, to become a reality uh, it has been an interesting path to follow i mean i was the gamer back in the days where we were happy to get like a few hundred euros salary by now we are talking millions uh, all across teams for example so it has been an amazing growth um, to be honest, I actually expected it to kind of grow that really? way. It's not like um, it, it's coming by full surprise, but it's definitely hitting harder than I expected. In which point do you expect it? Uh, especially the numbers part, if we see all the, the money floating around, there is mm -hmm. definitely a huge increase also in the last couple of years, really. Mm -hmm. There was like a, a point in time, especially after finance crisis period, where it wasn't that fast growing, but mm -hmm. especially with all the franchises now coming in as well, I think that really kickstarted again. Um, but for me, it has never been a question that this phenomenon will, will grow into something else because I've experienced this first person. We knew for a fact that the generation, my generation, the generation that follows will always grow up with something connected to gaming. So they will naturally experience esports in one way or the other. And then it's only about getting this attention in order to make this the ecosystem we know nowadays. Right. 
next generation is native. Everyone is native. <laughs> so, and I think I love that you brought up the German broadcast of, of League of Legends World Final, and I think that is a moment that characterizes us as a team pretty well. And I think it was definitely one of the reasons why I joined G2 after Red Bull is because there is a good understanding in the organization that while competitive success is, in is incredibly important for us, entertainment is equally important. And I think this is what this team really celebrates. And every team member really ha has this running through their veins. Um, we really see ourselves closer to, like Carlos always says this, he sees us closer to Disney than to a football club, for example, right? We really Maybe want that's to the entertain. reason why I like you so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so really, we're all about entertaining our audience. Our content team is by far the biggest in, in mm. our organization, so that gives you an indication of focus. And we love storytelling, um, and we do it incredibly well. Um, right, definitely. So, I think that is, I think, one of our recipes for success and we definitely continue building that going forward. This year you voted for the eSports Team of the Year, congratulations for that. Um, how long does it take you to be on that point you are now? When did we establish it too? <laughs> Pretty much four years ago. Yeah. Uh, so really? that's, years. Yeah, that's the interesting thing that many may actually forget about that. G2 is still a new player on the market. It's not like a brand like Fnatic or SK that has always been around and has grown that massively over 20 years. It's just like G2 has been around for four years now and really took But G2 off. felt so. That's the thing. Like, yeah, right. It shows that we do something right, of course. And uh, as Sabrina said, the focus obviously on some part competitive success, which obviously helps the brand growing. But then you also have to, to monetize or like make use of the chances when you succeed in a game that you also entertain the people accordingly and make them attached to your team and to your brand. So I think this is what we do well. Um, some teams achieve that within just one, two, three, four years like we do. Other keep fighting and, and try to get the puzzle together. But I definitely think it's like the teamwork that we see in this entire company that put us where we are right now. And Carlos is ahead and the idea and the... How, how did you describe his position here? Is he, is he only a, not a normal CEO, I think? <laughs> Or is he? Well, he's much more no, like I this, wouldn't. I think. I wouldn't say he's the normal CEO. I think, first of all, it's a great mix in, t in general of expertise in our management board. Carlos is obviously the face for us and the person we turn to, besides um, Peter, who's our COO, who has a um, 20 plus years experience in big um, corporations. So he knows corporate life really well. And he came in at the right exact time to help us moving from a startup into a bigger organization right there's a lot of workflows there are a lot of processes that need to be developed and that's where peter came came in at the exact right time but we should also not forget about jens um jens is the co-founder of g2 he's like the godfather of esports esports i think that's fair to say uh, founded the esl and has been an integral part of this the success obviously right Uh, yeah, Carlos is, is something you can you can imagine yourself that you feel like him. So especially on the world ships, I feel what he say, and I I, I I can't imagine how it felt for him to be so deep inside when it touched me so much, and I'm not so deep as him. Yeah, yeah and it also helps us so. on, on team operations side as well. If you have a CEO like this, who can also get close to the players. Yeah, right. It's like having this mentorship just. At the highest level of the company, it really can lead the player in a certain kind of way as well and, and make them understand the bigger picture as well, of course. That's very good. How's the structure and the organization from an esports team? It's not a classical company, isn't it? Mm. I think like one or two years ago, it was definitely different than it is now. So the last year has been incredible for us in terms of new people that we hired we got expertise in from different areas and industries such as our commercial director lindsay who comes from the nfl and has an in-depth agency background as well so we really try to get ready to expand our brand not only from a from a perception standpoint but also from a geographical standpoint so north america is important for us china is more and more important for us right so we're getting expertise in And while we grow, we obviously develop ourselves into a somewhat normal organization, mm -hmm. but we try to keep a bit of 
the startup yeah. life that we had a year ago. I think it's very important yeah. to, to keep this though, because it's the feeling here. If you come here, I, I don't I don't feel like I'm, I'm visiting a company. So I visit a team. I everything is so detailed, lovely. I, I don't I don't can't describe it. Maybe we can go around with the camera and show something. Sure. Yeah. So it's so lovely, and you feel it when you come here. Mm -hmm. So that's very good. Um, so, yo, you know. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Switch between German and English is not that easy sometimes. Um, how many um, employees do you have? Full time, part time. So when we are in this company aspect from G two. I mean, Back I office can, around forty. Yeah, I can tell. I think players and staff team that are working around the players. We are roughly fifty right now. And the players. Including the players. Including. Yeah. Okay. Right. And you have the location. Um, why you choose Berlin? So no, I don't know that G2 is located in Germany. So Where would you have thought we would be? America. Yes. Really? That's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Because many people connected to Spain, thanks to yeah. Carlos, of course. And I mean, it has been there before. It basically started in Madrid as a company. Um, unfortunately, we both haven't been here, here when, <laughs> the real, uh, when the move happened to Berlin. So we can't comment on that too much, but if you put the puzzle pieces together with LEC, League of Legends being in, in Berlin and this developing more and more into some kind of esports city, um, it was just one plus one together. If you move the company here, being close to the team that is also playing here in the LEC, and then on top of that, PUBG with the PEL also moved to Berlin. So they're kind of creating this little capital around these leagues here. So it just fit it together that we move here. Okay, and many of your speak German so in the social media channels you always choose English why you choose English you could also do it in Spanish or German or we see ourselves as a global brand and I think that's the exercise that probably also every football club at some point goes through right um, we want to be perceived as a global brand that doesn't mean that we are neglecting our, our local audience um, so you'll see like local jerseys that we produced in the past or around world specifically where we put up a, a dedicated campaign just for our German fans together with cool. Domino's, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this is stuff we want to do more of. We want to celebrate our local fan communities, but that doesn't mean that we as G2 see ourselves as a global club. And especially looking at esports and looking at a Gen Z and millennial audience that is um, getting more and more um, English native, it just makes sense for us to have English as our company Obviously, language. Obviously, it works, because I don't know that you're located in Germany. So, but... Um, how is it when your team compete as a word, like now, and they all go, go along with it, and you talk about it after they come here, and you speak with them, and they, I think it's, it's, for them, very emotional too, so it's... It hurts like a little bit, or not just a little the, bit. The, yeah. the, a the, the Asian guys, I don't know the name, so sorry for that. But they, they say G two had make not no good job on the stage, and I think, why you do this? And I don't understand this fight. So. No, I mean, we also have to be realistic and honest, and I think um, uh, the comments that FBX did afterwards is definitely correct. We could have done a way better job, of course. Okay. Um, the guys were just not on point on that day. It just happens sometimes. It's just normal sports that something isn't working on the day. It is what it is. Uh, we just have to move on and do better next time. And this is also, and that was the, the specific, or like also the special moment we had with this team afterwards, because I was backstage when they entered uh, the locker room after literally after they lost and it was yeah. like three minutes of silence just like pure yeah. silence and then they pretty much opened up saying um, first of all there's no need to discuss the game right now we have plenty of time to refocus for the for the next season there's like no need to to go too deep into this game but every one of them as a group of people and group uh, as a team committed or like pretty much opened up saying we all could have done better we basically lost the final together uh, no blame put on anyone it's just like a team effort to get where we are 
And to get the next step, we have to work as a team together moving forward. And we have this fantastic atmosphere with this team in particular that probably no other League of Legends team has experienced before because more often than not, especially after Worlds, these teams that have such a rough loss just break apart because of emotions uh, mixed around, especially with these young people. But this group we have right here is so special. They already focused five minutes after the loss on next season. They knew, okay, we, we kind of have done mistakes here and there. We can do better. Let's focus on doing it better. Because That's why we... they have such a good background, I think. So um, my parents always said to me, give someone a good background and wings to fly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that matches your spirit here, right? Yeah, we've got someone that supports us as well. With yes, <laughs> yeah, huh? No, but I, I think to Danny's point, it, it was painful for all of us to watch, but we also shouldn't forget how incredible this season has been for this team. Right? You're right. A team that had literally zero days off um, from January onwards. Um, put up an incredible performance, made us proud, were entertaining as hell at the mm -hmm. same time. Yeah. Um, so for us, not only from a partner standpoint, but from a G2 club standpoint, we couldn't wish for a better league team right now. So they, um, I think, and I'm sure they are at the stage now where they can look back to last season and say, yeah, we did an incredible job. And next year on the anniversary, you get it, right? In China. Exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's gonna hurt even more. Yeah, that's that's what I think as I heard. Yeah, right. And um, how do you choose your athletes? Not only League of Legends, all of us. Yeah, it's, it's a combination of many, many things, of course. Uh, the main target is obviously that we achieve competitive success. So a player has to fit into our team in order to be the number one team in the world, of course. So obviously skill comes into to mind, of course, at the first time. Um, but as I said, it's a combination of many things. Obviously, partnership would like to have a player that you can put in front of camera that also understands a bigger picture of esports that's super important to have. And we look more into, um, from a team ops perspective, to have a player that can perform under crunch time because it's good if he has the skill to be good in any public game. But if you are on the world stage in a grand final where 80,000 people are watching yeah, around, right. it's a whole different, different environment, yeah. whole different scenario. And players that really prove themselves on a crunch time are definitely way more valuable for us. And also the harmony between the team. Um, you can see it with the League of Legends team, but we have also done a switch recently with the Counter-Strike team. And the atmosphere within the team is so completely different now. They, they pick up on this mentality that the League of Legends team have, where they have way more fun together, where they have, where they even make fun of each other, even in bad moments. Like even if we lose games, it's just like, okay, we throw a little bit around and just move on and, and try to do it better next time instead of just going into literally depression or something. Uh, so this is super important that you have this healthy environment, which also reflects our brand in the end. Yeah, right. And do the teams come here to train sometimes or train there by yourself online together? And how how a day looks like here for the team? It depends from team to team, of course. So for example, for League of Legends and PUBG, we actually have gaming houses here in Berlin, all across Berlin, uh, where they live and play together mm -hmm. on 24 seven basis. Um, and then for the remaining teams, especially Counter-Strike and Rainbow Six, we bring them to the office quite often so that they can come together and play as a group of people instead of just online. But especially for Counter-Strike, it's less off because they're traveling so much with tournament anyways, where they are already together so that we grant them a little bit of off time there. Um, but we are moving more and more into trying to get the people or trying to get the teams together on a constant basis. So for example, for Rainbow Six, we are looking into getting a gaming house as well so that they can work together on a 24-7 basis. And for Rocket League in the US, it's pretty much the same idea because they benefited so much from the boot camps we did in the US. Uh, we did this before Worlds, we did it now before the promotion, the promotion tournament. The performance just peaked in that moment, which yeah. kind of tells me, okay, you have to bring the guys together because they're just way more productive if they're together instead yeah, of just Yeah, personally, it's so much yeah. more, yeah, I think, yeah. And um, you say Counter-Strike. We talk to many companies and um, that's what you say on the eSports Summit. Some companies have very much problems with the shooters. Um, was at any time it a discussion at G2 if you take shooters in the program and have a shooter team? Yeah, I mean, my, my point at eSports Summit is I think the same point I always say to every brand we mm. talk to. If you want to authentically engage with an esports audience, then don't cut out 
the majority right. of it, right? Exactly, right. So I think um, in that respect, I'm just hopeful that more and more brands will celebrate this industry as a whole. Um, we completely understand that some brands take a bit of longer time to get into esports, get their feet wet, get com comfortable with it, and something like League of Legends, Rocket League, Hearthstone can be great access points. But um, if you obviously want to leverage the entire esports audience, then you need to get familiar with, uh, with Counter-Strike and also open up your mind how extremely complex and challenging this game is from a, from a mental standpoint and from a performance standpoint. Because this is oftentimes easy neglected. When people vocalize stereotypes about shooters, it tells me that they don't really understand the game as much. I mean, Danny can talk more about that, but that's, I think, that's the message I wanted to bring across last time. Right, that's so that's the reason why I, I uh, would lo love to talk to you, because that's the point. And um, if we, we hear the discussion from the DOSB, and especially the thing that they say shooters are violence uh, mm -hmm. as well, and they say that the real violence in boxing, for example, is another way because that's a competition and something but in esports nobody get hurt so and it's more about tactics isn't it yeah i would say the guys talking about violence in a shooting game have probably never been at an esports event before because even if you go to cologne to the lancaster arena which is like one of the hard uh, uh, arenas in in germany they all celebrate and love the game because of what the game is and not because they are shooting each other. It's like, it's, it's literally a combination of teamwork. It's pretty much like playing chess together with five people against five people. And the only target is that the one five people want to be better than the other five people. And they can achieve this through different kind of targets, which is either eliminating the whole other team, planting a bomb, defusing a bomb or running out of time. And this is just the, the rule set that they have and then play according to this rule set. And it's more about the competition than the actual violence that we see in this game. And you will never see any violence in an esports game. You see hooligans in football stadium uh, more violent than any other esports person ever was on the planet, I guess. Um, yeah, it's it always bugs me if, if uh, especially DSOB talks about uh, shooters and also compares it to boxing, for example. I always like to come up with uh, the, the example of um, shooting in real life because it's part of the Olympic Games as well. And where's the difference between that and Counter-Strike? I would even say Counter-Strike is even more deeper because instead of just shooting at the target, I have team play involved, I have communication involved, I have strategy involved, I even have more entertainment involved, more excitement involved. And it's pretty much the same thing, right? right? Both people kind of shoot at the same target. The one does it in real life, gets a gold medal for it, and the one does it virtually, not even thinking about shooting probably, and is seen as a violent people. Right. It doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, right. Uh, I'm fully agree. So, um, the person from the DOSB in the show last for a few weeks ago also said that uh, esports is a lot about destroying also in League of Legends. You destroy the other guys and something. And I don't know if they're really, as you say, if, if they really watch esports or if they just look two minutes and say, Okay, something exploding, not for me. So I don't know. What would you say, not only the shooters, esports as well? Esports, for me, definitely is sports. So motorsports, um, sim racing is um, motorsports in Germany, so the other sports need to come after that because they are so much bigger here, yeah, right? What would you say? I, as you said, I also think it's a sport. I get the points that it's not as physical as other sports might be, but as I said, the comparison for me for shooting or archery, for example, is pretty much the same. They're not physical either. They're more about being precise, being focused, and that's the, the mental part of esports as well. It's also about being focused, being precise, having the teamwork in some games, of course. But it's more about your, your, the sport with the brain you do instead of the, the body you do. That's probably the main difference uh, that we can see there. But in the end, all everything around still has, especially a competitive environment, pretty much the same atmosphere and also the, the, the focus as traditional sports as well. 
And I would love to pick up on what Danny just said in terms of entertainment. If you've seen events like, I don't know, Counter Strike in Lanxess Arena or uh, Worlds League of Legends, this is yeah. pure entertainment, right? So right. actually a lot of traditional sports properties should have watched this opening ceremony and get some inspiration from it. Right. And definitely. so that would be an, an incre uh, incredibly interesting space going forward in the next couple of years, how esports is actually celebrating not only the competitive sports side of the business, but really the mm -hmm. entertainment side. And if then people want to debate whether it's a sport or not, or not, well, they're more than happy and f f um, welcome to do so. But it's not really relevant for us in our daily life because we know what we're doing. We know we're successful in what we're doing. Whether you want to call this an esportainment format or industry or a sport, I don't mind to be honest. <laughs> Same in the players as well. They yeah. don't really care about this. They have their competitive environment. They love what they do. We don't need to be called sport or not. It doesn't really affect what yeah, we do in daily life. Yeah, that's important thing. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah, all right. And um, esports has grown bigger and bigger the last years, and also interesting marketing channel for some companies. So they choose it as a marketing mix. And um, you're at the point that companies come to you, right? How do the companies call uh, call you? So what do they say? So hey, would you like my money here? What? Yeah, I mean, they? if you look at all the big uh, media and marketing conferences that are happening in the US and also in Europe, whenever there is an entertainment or a sports focus, there's always going to be esports on the agenda in the last year, right? So you naturally meet people that used to be involved in traditional sports but are very, very interested in media. And then obviously, if you are media savvy, you know the numbers and then you start getting involved and trying to understand esports, right? So conferences is one thing where we obviously have a lot of conversations. Events is another one um, where we always encourage brands to really come join us for events and just get a taste for it. Um, and that's basically our touch points and then oftentimes through context and people approach us and it's um, it's great to start because oftentimes brands come to us and say, you know, we know we need to get into esports, but we've got no idea how um, and we're really scared a bit as well because it's a very vocal audience. Um, Gen Z's are very expressive um, and if you if you're not capable of having an authentic entry into esports you might rethink your strategy, right? Because otherwise right. it might backlash very quickly. And I think that's where partnership with us comes in because we we know how to set up uh, campaigns. We know what the tonality should be. We know what kind of content resonates with our fans. And a League of Legends fan is oftentimes different in terms of interest than a Counter-Strike um, fan, mm. right? So also that shouldn't be forgotten. So I think we are quite good in trying to navigate our partners through this and try to give them an access point that they feel comfortable with. Okay, that's, and when you, when you start, um, how did you get the first sponsor for your team? Oh, when you were... more for you, eh? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's more for me, but I wasn't there. Right? <laughs> I, I remember it was so lovely because for, for Worlds, we partnered up with Domino's. Uh, but actually, Carlos used to be sponsored by Domino's when he was still a professional player. Mm. So this relationship goes way back to his <laughs> prof uh, professional mm. career. They also then only found out at that stage. It's obviously a completely different team by now. But uh, you can tell that with some brands, we even had an attachment before G2 even existed. And then looking at partners like PaySafeCard or Logitech, we worked with them for four or five years at times, right? From so the very beginning. Very so. beginning. Yeah, and right. I think PaySafeCard is, is a great example. When they started getting into esports, there wasn't much of a brand awareness for PaySafeCard in the space. And there also wasn't much brand awareness for G2 at that stage, right? But we partnered up, we grew together, we learned together as well. And now I think PaySafeCard is well known in the space yeah, as a right. payment option in esports and gaming. Uh, and hopefully we are quite well known in the space as well <laughs> as the team yeah, right. does a lot of things right. <laughs> so I think this is one of the beautiful examples where it's not necessarily the case that you always have to partner with the biggest brand. Um, 
but you also can actually grow together and kind of explore this space together. And Logitech um, is another great example where we really challenge our ourselves on a daily basis, right? So they involve our players into research and development because they really want our players to be happy with the product that comes out on the market. Um, so it's a, it's a constant back and forth, but that's how both sides just get better. And that's our understanding of a partnership. Right. That's very good what you say, because <laughs> when we go to companies, we, we try to explain them how this, this business works, because it's not the normal marketing. You can use not the normal examples on this area. You, you, for esports, you need completely new marketing instruments, I think. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah correct. Because if you just translate traditional sports into esports, so traditional sports worked also not now anymore, but in the past used to work a lot with just blank visibility, whether that's banner branding, etc. Doesn't resonate in esports. The digital audience is so um, is so much looking for an authentic integration, and whether that's bringing value to the community or to the player or helps funding tournaments. All of that. So if you as a brand can demonstrate that you're bringing value to the community and to the industry, that's when you have an authentic dialogue with your fan base. Yeah, you need to know the community. You need to go into exactly. it and you need yeah. to work with them. So esports is a fast growing industry, right? And you need, at the other side, you need much time to get a foothold in this because you, you can't go into esports in one week. So you can do a crash course uh, in the weekend. And many companies don't understand that. They think I have, if I invest money, so I'm the biggest player in the whole game in two weeks, but it doesn't work. No, and I think also that's not un our understanding of a partnership. We ov obviously work sometimes with partners on a campaign basis, but that's like, one or two quarters for example but always with the intention that if this works out we want to go walk that right. journey on a long-term basis mm -hmm. um, but in general all the partnerships we have are long-term and that's really important for us because it takes time to just adjust to each other understand how both parties tick right especially in the lead up to actual uh, to an actual contract we spend a lot of time in trying to find the sweet spot of those two brands, right? Because that's like our authentic playground, right? That's where we can play. And um, it's not that easy to always find the strategic sweet spot. And once we found it, then you go into what is the stories we can tell together? What are the content formats that sit well with both our brand perceptions? And how can we tell stories across ours and our partners' channels? All this takes time and it's sometimes a bit trial and error as well. Uh, depending on how well we know this brand. Um, so for us, having one-offs doesn't feel right. It's not, it's not our understanding. And in your sure. opinion, how long does it take to get to know each other in, in a very good partnership so you can work and grow together? Um, so I would say for our global partnerships, when you look at like Red Bull or Logitech and you see some other announcements in the um, next month, um, I would say a quarter to two quarters is needed to really because then you have produced a couple of content formats together you have done three four different campaigns together the um the brand was then able to work with some of our players and meet them at events so they tried to find out okay maybe <laughs> our brand is more suited towards the counter-strike team or brands come and say we really want to work with the league team right all this takes time okay um, it's a development process same in a relationship right if you move right. in with someone not everything on the be yeah. uh, <laughs> right. day one so yeah, you right. kind of have to get to know each other and i would say like three to six months is usually the window until you really know um if it works or not that means the partners come to you too and say okay i want to work with you but they don't know which way they want to work with you so they get to know players and very personally to get a feeling for the players, right? Players and really us as G2. So we always, especially for bigger brand conversation, we try to bring people from different departments. So Danny is obviously always there to give insights on how our professional side of things work. Mm -hmm. So um, team development and competitive success. 
um, because that's usually also a bit of a blank spot for some of our partners. Um, and then we really have long-term um, strategy sessions where we do annual planning, we discuss what kind of content formats we want to produce together, at what kind of events we want to collaborate together, how can we help, like what is the, the integral part that our partner wants to solve, the challenge they want to solve with partnering with us. So whether that's increasing brand awareness or driving sales um, or promoting a certain product, all this needs to be discussed. And then based on that, we jointly develop a strategy for the year ahead. Okay, and the cooperation you have, one with Veritas, I think. Mm -hmm. What the plan with Veritas? <laughs> <laughs> so Veritas um, decided to put up a 2,000 square meter esportainment facility in the heart of Berlin. Wow, um, okay. It's called Level. And uh, then they told Carlos about it. <laughs> and, uh, and then Carlos straight away said, no, there's no other team that will be involved. It's going to be just us. And that's where this started. Um, so we were doing this together with Veritas. It's going to launch uh, beginning of Q2, I believe, um, mm -hmm. next year. We're really excited about that because it gives us the opportunity to have more, create more offline touch points with our fan base. We we'll also have a private uh, training seg uh, segment there in, in, a, in the facility, even with a private exit, so the guys can come in, come out without being seen necessarily. Uh, there's also a public area uh, with a big stage set up where we can run tournaments. Oh, cool. Just G2 okay. will have mm -hmm. around 20 events in that facility wow. per year, so it gives you a feeling for the intensity. Um, so this is really about celebrating the the digital immersions that you have around esports and taking them offline into this space and it's for gamers and also in esports enthusiasts so when you come in there's going to be a robot that um, uh, does um, burgers for you so it's an innovation <laughs> and tech angle there as Ooh, well because okay. that's what our our audience is really um, interested in and then there is more touch points that are more gaming related and then once you walk through the facility, it gets kind of deeper and deeper and deeper into esports. And then on the lower level, you'll have more of an overview on um, uh, and gaming facilities, streaming facilities. So it, it's really meant to be a, a meeting point for everyone that is interested in entertainment and esports and gaming. Sounds very interesting. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited for it too. So. Um, and what are the next goals with your teams? Oh, that's one of the goals, I think, that you open these facilities. Yeah. And so what other plans? I mean, do you Danny, have? Danny should speak for competitive success, but from a from a G two overall standpoint, yeah, facilities one. We will also open an esports cafe here in uh, Berlin. Also, a more private meeting point where fans can come together, watch matches together, um, just exchange on our love for esports. Um, and then the second part is obviously uh, market expansion. We already have a very strong footprint in the US and we continue to grow this. So we're looking into opening a second office on the East Coast, um, besides Berlin. Um, and China is big for us as well, also no surprise. Obviously we're looking into um, growing our healthy footprint in, um, in Asia. We're doing very well already, um, but this will be a big one. And um, some other projects which I can't talk about just yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for competitive success, obviously it depends on the team. But if you look at League of Legends, there's only one addition staff that uh, you can yeah, take think, from yeah. That's 2019. Safe for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so obviously you want to at least repeat that success. Obviously take the final step as well. It would be great for Counter Strike with the restructure of the team into an international team. We hope to lift trophies in the near future as well, of course. Um, Rainbow Six, they just had the international title uh, in the Six Invitation this year. So we want to pick the success up for next year as well. Uh, Rocket League, also they have been at Worlds, finished second place, and kind of getting tired of finishing second. They, they really want to lift the, the trophy, of course. Right. So it's all about winning titles in the end, and the more the better it is, of course. And maybe the Grand Slam next week, uh, year, so that would That's be nice. Changes. Yeah, right. <laughs> but when we're talking about Asia, I, would, uh, I should ask for somebody which the samurai come from. Oh, that's that's a story that Carlos is way better uh, <laughs> to talk about, to be honest. 
I heard him talk about this story of the samurai and I would really encourage you to ask him personally because he's the best to tell you the story. <laughs> we will do this after this. Much better than Danny and I could ever do. <laughs> <laughs> and it was his, his idea, you know? Yeah, it's kind of a development. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. right. It's okay. a very personal <laughs> one. So that's why, um, that's why I think it makes sense for you to ask him. Okay, about. right. <laughs> and the social media presents is very well and you're very good than Mimi, so <laughs> I don't know anybody is better in this. So is there one person who to the fingerprint on this or is it um, a whole team these days? It's the biggest team of the organization, as I said, it's content and social. They are doing an incredible job. Content is led by Karina. Um, and she's been with G2 from the early days mm -hmm. and um, has been growing this, this team and our storytelling footprint for a while now. And um, so it's not only a one person show anymore, it's really a lot of experts coming into the space. Um, as I said, Karina for content, but also Chris, who's heading our social mm -hmm. team, doing an incredible job of being perceived as the meme kings in the industry, and we <laughs> quite like that. And we will continue to push for it. And I think one of the reasons why people recognize us on social is that we continuously try to push the agenda when it comes to storytelling. We also never shy away of new formats. Last year, for example, we launched Making the Squad, which was an esports entertainment, like a casting show almost for Fortnite. Um, this year we did it with TFT. So we are really continuously working on whether that's new show formats or documentaries. We released the one hour documentary about Wales. It's very emotional. I can highly recommend to watch it. Um, so I think all of this continuous work on new formats and our social team really being at the pulse of time when it comes to storytelling is just that great mix that makes the magic happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can say it this way. Um, we talk earlier these days about sim racing and esports and the difference. And how do you see the difference between sim racing and esports for the guys who don't see the other podcast? Um, yeah, I always say that sim racing is pretty much how esports felt when I was still active. Um, so, like five to ten years behind. The development we see on the likes of Riot, we see on the likes of all the tournament organizers, ESL going to the big arenas and, and stuff like that. Obviously, sim racing isn't there quite yet, mm -hmm. but the first big players are entering into the market, especially Formula One. Um, we also have seen Formula E before. They're surely thinking behind the scenes as well what they can do with sim racing because it's their DNA. And there's obviously a high interest, especially on the automotive industry, to make use of sim racing as some first step into esports kind of thing. Um, but everything still seems pretty undeveloped and there are a lot of yeah, big players and stakeholders coming together in this market and trying to steer it into a certain kind of direction that probably benefits them the most. I can't blame them for that, but this is basically the process that also esports went through, especially around 2010-ish, where we have also seen a lot of tournaments appear and disappear. And in the end, you have now the big names uh, basically popping out and structuring esports system as we know, especially with the franchise system. I'm not saying that the franchise system is the way to go for sim racing, but we definitely have to find in sim racing this process that we have to go through in the next couple of years that it's really sustainable for, for everyone involved. In your opinion, would you think this process in esports is complete? So this No, okay. uh, definitely not. I mean, I was just in Lithuania doing a speech about my role in G2 as well and there was one uh, question from, from the crowd who also asked me what I think about franchising. I'm like, I cannot judge on that. It depends on what seat you are in. You love the franchise or you hate the franchise. Obviously, if you are in and we really love how Riot is doing uh, the franchise system and really benefit from it and are super happy with it, obviously we can't complain. But then you see other ideas like Overwatch, or also Call of Duty, who are going more into the city kind of thing. Also taking the, the esports DNA out of their teams because they're not really working with brands like G2 Esports or other brands on the market and just try to do their own ecosystem. Maybe that's the way to go. We will only see what Times tells us in the future. It's not the, the route that we are going at least. I mean, we are not involved in Overwatch. We are not involved in Call of Duty. We believe in our brand and just want to push our brand in a certain kind of direction. But It all comes down to time that really shows us where esports will lead to. 
I'm very excited where it goes to. Me too. So the last years it was incredible a uh, boost. <laughs> you say it. <laughs> so um, sim racing for me is a special thing because it's our hard project. When you sing, so um, because that's the reason I want to ask something in this area for you, mm -hmm. especially I think this mm -hmm. is for you the right. Um, sim racing is at the moment at the point that you see it, big players come into the scene and they do i don't know if this word is in english correct but they do a fast shoot so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right um and they think they can be in the scene but sim racing is not a, a complete other thing as esports because it's it's a part of it but it's completely different how do you see this i agree it's definitely out like it's different i'm not say outstanding but it's like a niche in our esports ecosystem for sure. I pretty much would say that 95, maybe 98, even 99% of League of Legends players do not even know that there's something like right. competitive uh, car racing uh, in the esports world as well. So this is something where sim racing can still develop in a sense that we get more and more eyeballs on what we are actually doing. Pretty much what esports has also had to do 10 years ago in order to get where we are right now in the mainstream uh, stance. Um, uh, yeah, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Lost it there. Sim racing is completely different. Correct. Yeah, right. Um, but as I said, it's, or as you said, it's part of eSports for sure. And there are surely benefits from connecting the worlds together. So we in G2 are proud that we have this DNA of actually being involved in sim racing and it really pays off for us as well. Um, I mean, not every other brand can, can, uh, be proud of working together with Red Bull Racing or right. any other Formula One team. So that's definitely a cool step. And this is also the direction I hope some racing will all go in the future that we pick up expertise from esports, mainstream esports as well, and also then from the motorsports industry as well, and just try to get the most out of it and the most professional product in the end. How do you see this? thing with sim racing because you can't cut off something from esports but would you involve sim racing in this or would you say okay companies could go in sim racing or in esports or both no i definitely see it as one one, one big thing because i mean in if you go that route you can also cut out hearthstone for example right you're right so i think for me this is one industry it's different titles it's so diverse as sports is as such right um so for us we leverage it we we are lucky as danny said we are lucky to have this um diverse set of titles that um we are involved in and that's a big plus of like for brands working with us because they can choose which titles they want to engage with and I hope many companies and CEOs see this podcast and um, think about the whole eSport thing. What would you and you, both of you, uh, would say to them to be brave, I say it like this, um, to go into this scene? Because it's, you say it before, they're scared, they don't know the scene. For them, it's completely new. What would you say to them? Yeah, I think... Um I, depending which brand I, I am and how open I can be, I always encourage the, the people to not market their product towards their management team, but towards their consumers. And if you attend an esports event and you know you're marketing your product towards a millennial and Gen Z audience, and you go and see this event, see how engaged fans are, um, then there's no way around esports, right? And um, I think. There is many um, also non-violent titles, as I said, if brands want to get engaged with that one first, they will see incredible return on investments, um, regardless which title they choose. And um, I think it's just doing little steps. No one expects from a brand that has never had any affiliation with esports to go in 360 yet. Some brands do, and we really, really like it, because obviously, if you go in 360, we are also able to then activate this partner 360 right. right so for us it's great but we also appreciate if brands want to take a, a slower uh, approach there, right. but um you just need to get your feet wet right you have to start somewhere because just being concerned um won't get you anywhere and i think now is still a good point 
in time to get involved into esports, comparing it to traditional sports package um, packages, monetary value. I think uh, esports still offers a lot um, in terms of return on investment. So um, yeah, I encourage brands to just start somewhere and whether that's starting to work with a streamer, starting to work with us as a whole or with some of our players or with one specific team or creating a campaign together doesn't really matter, but just get your feet wet, start somewhere because then you can actually evaluate if it works for you or if it doesn't. Great. Yeah. I would always say uh, they should never be scared and I'm more specifically thinking about a person now, not, not the brand itself. Uh, because they just remember back in time when they first, I don't know, went to a racing track or went into a football stadium. Uh, it was new to them as well, right? But we all love the sports that we see on television and, and we enjoy uh, individually. So I, for example, am more into ice hockey, others are more into football, whatever. Um, they should just take the courage and go to an esports event. That's the, the best thing you can do to experience it at hand and really see the sport in action, really feel the atmosphere as well. Like, <laughs> that scene in Paris was just amazing and Worlds final this year has probably topped every other esports event I've also attended. That was mind blowing to me. And it's great to see that, especially when you when you talk to corporate brands, they oftentimes they understand it. Not sometimes they understand it from a marketing and media standpoint. But also they start to really understand it when they have kids in that age, right? And you've <laughs> yeah, got right. your son is playing Fortnite or your mm. daughter is into League of Legends and then they play it at home and they know how excited they are about the game and then they, that they made friends while playing online. And all of a sudden this industry becomes much more tangible because your daughter or your, your son is actually so involved in the scene, right? So that also And then helps think well. about this aspect, um, the, the people when I was in this age, so I was alone playing. So I played for me alone in my home and on the PC. Now they can play together. They can keep in contact with someone um, who is interested in the same things. And you are not so alone, I think, as the earlier days, right? Yeah. Especially if you go the competitive way in a team game, you just have to work together on almost a daily basis if you want to become a professional gamer as well. Obviously, there's a huge amateur scene as well be below what we are doing. And uh, I love to say this as a joke every now and then, especially if I travel with the teams. Obviously, I can't be around the team every single time. But I probably see those guys more often than my own family back at home. So that's the feeling they should have as well, because at some point when you are an upcoming gamer, you are coming together so often. We just saw it in our sim racing team. The guys two years ago never traveled to any event, but mm. this year they probably came together for literally two months straight just to work for this one target. And you work as a team and get to know each other as a team. And then obviously have also this friendship bonding as a team together as well. Yeah. It's very nice to see. So Definitely. people in, in this age don't get in contact the normal, normal way as we do it earlier well, so for them it's normal right it's yeah right it's the individual definition of normal but i think they're not there it's easier for them because it's okay. easier to to have the same interests true earlier yeah, you need to go a natural e filter yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and before them esports it, it it's not not that easy so mm -hmm. and you say traveling around the world if you travel around the world um how do you see the differences in the countries and the affinity to esports um there are definitely differences um i feel like and i've actually had the luxury as a player back in the days and this is literally like 10 years ago five years ago where i traveled myself to iran a country you you probably think differently about open up a whole new culture for me and also already showed back then how passionate that they also are about esports like a market that we rarely think about but also have a huge fan base around these these professional gamers and it was just a mind-blowing experience. And this is also the experience that not only players, but also fans are getting when they're coming together at events. Mm -hmm. And it's so multicultural that there's probably also no other sport in the world that can bring different kind of nationalities together, different kind of mindsets together to just celebrate what, what we all love, and that's basically esports. And which country would you say is the strongest in the different parts? Because I have a talk to an uh, Williams um, sim racer, 
And he said, if there's one place on earth where I would live, it would be Germany because Germany is, an, is a good place for sim racing. What would you say the other esports titles? Or did you do the Kui with him? I mean, back in the days, everyone talked about South Korea because that was like the place where esports was already that far advanced that they are literally pop stars in their countries. I think by now it has definitely shifted more into what China. So mm -hmm. China is definitely a huge place for esports to be. But I also envy uh, the US every now and then because they just celebrate it way bigger than we do. They also go way more all in when it comes to literally everything, to events, to sponsorships, to teams. They just try to get to the maximum, like really do it American style, do it big. Um, and that's something really amazing to me to, to see as well. But I would definitely say right now the place to be is probably China. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you agree. Yeah, I think in terms of also um, how culturally different esports is being celebrated, and I think South America is an interesting one as well. That's right? true. Yeah, that's um, really true. From more from a from an atmosphere standpoint, yeah, right? right? I mean, the crowd crowd goes absolutely wild. I'm not saying that doesn't happen in Europe or in in Asia, but I think South America sometimes really stands out. We see that at events where there's a South American yeah. team advancing to. Um, quarters or semis and, and the atmosphere is, is nuts um, and then obviously for us also Poland is a big market oh, right? that's true yeah. and in which level do you see Germany when you see the whole of uh, the countries you were in yeah Germany is one of our top markets yeah, in terms of fan bases yeah and it's also because of all the publishers basically having these leagues in Germany like League of Legends like PUBG It definitely makes um, Germany an important country, obviously with ESL having its footprint here as well. Um, but we have to fight fights, especially politics and the, the mainstream uh, audience around esports that other countries definitely don't have to fight anymore. And this is definitely where Germany could improve and also help us to leverage the esports way more over yeah. here as well, I think. Look a bit to Scandinavian countries like Denmark, for example, where esports has is is seen and recognized also by politics in a completely different way. So I think there's still room for improvement to go, yeah. um, especially in Germany. I think that's a good ending. <laughs> so uh, keep your mind open, watch what the other guys do. <laughs> um, and thank you for the invitation. Sure. Thank you. I would go Thanks around with the camera so to show, show <laughs> the people what I'm uh, talking about earlier. It was so nice. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for coming to Berlin. <laughs> Thank you.